There you go. How's that? Better? <laughs> Thank you all. So we got audio now. I also plugged in my uh, laptop today, so it will not be uh, losing power halfway through the stream. <laughs> so we should be on board here. So welcome to a Z Classroom Live. Uh, so we've been doing these developer streams daily to kind of get uh, ZBrush knowledge out to you guys that may be at home now. So doing ZBrush at home, and my streams are focusing on you know learning ZBrush. Uh, basically, if you've not used ZBrush before, you can download the trial from the web page here I have up. Uh, the trial will last you 30 days, and so you can download that. It is for Macintosh and uh, Windows, so it will not work on an iPad. So just one little note there with that, the trial will only work with a Windows PC or a Macintosh PC. So those two devices, um, you can download the trial, it's good for 30 days, and you can get in and start learning ZBrush. So definitely if you have some time on your hands, uh, you can start picking it up and learn some sculpting stuff. So in addition to this, I just want to hit on some other highlights for ZBrush as well. So we have a few ways you can get into ZBrush too. So we have uh, monthly subscriptions, uh, six month subscriptions, and we also have perpetual licenses. The perpetual license is basically we've never charged for a uh, upgrade fee, so it was a one-time fee. So I bought ZBrush when it was around $300 and I uh, never had to pay a upgrade fee, fee since. And that was well before I started working for Pixelogic. Uh, we also offer the single monthly uh, subscription plans and also six month. Uh, we also have ZBrush Core, which is our light version of ZBrush. So this is basically if you want to get into ZBrush, you can get in for as low as $10 a month. Uh, and then you can go to a perpetual yearly license as well. Um, and this is ZBrush Core is a lighter version. Uh, Daisuke, who you'll see his little uh, pip pop up down here at the bottom here, is doing some streams based on ZBrush Core. So it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, whistles as professional version does, um, but it does have what you need to kind of get in and sculpt. And there is an upgrade path going from ZBrush Core to the professional version. So for today's stream, what we're going to be focused on is IMM brushes, and I'm going to go through and make a little robot here uh, just using IMM parts. Now, IMM stands for Insert Multi Mesh, and so there's some brushes inside of ZBrush that store a bunch of geometry parts, and then you can drag those out on your model. So for the start here, we're just going to pretend like we have a fresh version of ZBrush, so we downloaded the trial, we launched it, and this is what we've got. So you're going to be greeted here by Lightbox, which is going to show up right here. And in here you can select different projects to start from. Uh, the main projects that I usually recommend starting from, if you're a first time user, is any of these spheres over here. So we have a 64, a 32, and a 128. Uh, any of these are good. Um, the versions or the numbers uh, on them just re represent how much topology the model has. So if you pick the real low topology version and you go to sculpt on it, your sculpt may look a little bit rough. So I usually recommend going for, say, the 128 sphere. To load these in, just double click, and this will launch that project right into ZBrush, and you should now have something like this. Now, the last two streams I've done, I've gone through some more of the navigation stuff, uh, spent a little time on that. So this one's going to be a little not as in-depth on that. So if you're looking for information on the navigation and how to kind of get started that way, definitely check out the first two streams um, in this Z Classroom Live series. But for the basics of navigation uh, inside of ZBrush, so I'm going to make just a mark here, and this can just be done by just sculpting on the model. If you click off on the empty spot of the canvas and drag, this is going to perform a rotate. And then if you hold down the Alt key on your keyboard, this is going to perform a pan. Now I have a little keyboard here I'm going to pull out too so you guys can follow along with this and you can see what keyboard presses I am using. So I'm just going to put that right there. And so just click and drag and we'll end up performing that rotate. And you can see these little buttons down here represent my mouse one and mouse two. And then this is my kind of where I'm orienting the mouse. So Alt and drag, we'll do a pan. Click and drag, we'll do a rotate. And as you're rotating, if you hold down Shift, this will snap into left, right, and side views. And then in addition to that, for the zoom, if you're a first time user, I recommend using this little zoom 3D option here. And this will zoom in and out on your model. The process to do it on your canvas is a little bit tricky. And if you're a first time user, it may not be very easy to pick up. I know it was one of the more difficult things for me to learn uh, when I was starting ZBrush. And the process to zoom in the canvas is you first want to hold down Alt and then click on the canvas like you're performing a pan. 
and then you want to release alt and you don't want to take that pressure off your mouse or your pen and so then you just drag after releasing alt and now perform a zoom so hold down alt click on the canvas which is going to give you that pan and then release alt while still holding down the mouse or the pen and then if you scroll up and down like so it'll end up zooming in and out of your model and then those functionalities will allow you to navigate around your mesh so today's uh, thing we talked about was the IMM brushes and there's a bunch of these that come preset inside of ZBrush so you can actually click through and uh, start building stuff with. Uh, to activate these we can go to the brush palette over here and open this up and in here, move my keyboard somewhere, we'll stick it right there for now. Um, in here you'll see a bunch of different brushes in here and these are all the ones that come preloaded with ZBrush. Now, if you hover over some of these, you'll see that they have this IMM prefix appended to them. So we have IMM basic, IMM boolean, IMM B parts, clothing, curve, gun, industrial parts, machine parts, model kit, and these are all IMM brushes. So these are the brushes that will contain these multi insert mesh parts, which are just pieces of geometry that you can then apply to your model. So the one we're gonna to use today is this IMM model kit brush, and we're gonna use this quite a bit as we're generating our pieces. So we come over here and select this. This is now going to select that brush. And as this loads in, you'll see at the top here, I'm gonna get this little bar that's gonna pop up. And this is gonna display all the different parts that are in this IMM brush. Now to use an IMM brush, the basics of it is that you need to have a subtool loaded in. So if you come over here and open up the tool palette, you'll see I have that polysphere there. And you need to make sure that your model does not have any subdivisions. So we talked briefly about subdivisions in the other streams. Uh, we're not really going to get into them here today. But basically, if you go to the Geometry tab, you should have nothing that says subdivisions. All this should be grayed out. If you have a subdivision on your model, and you can apply a subdivision by holding down Control and pressing D or clicking this Divide button, you want to make sure you delete that subdivision before using an IMN part. Because if I try to use an IMM part by clicking and dragging, I'm going to get a little dialog that's going to pop up. It's going to say, hey, this mesh is composed of multiple subdivision levels. You need to delete them or freeze them and try again. So I'm just going to hit escape and kill that. And then I'm just going to undo that uh, subdivision I added. So you can just do delete lower here, and that will get you back down to that lower one. Or you can go back to the original and delete higher, and now the mesh has no subdivisions. So now this model has no subdivisions, I can grab any of those brushes that were labeled that IMM uh, brush, that insert multi-mesh with that prefix. And if I just come up here and select one of these by just clicking, I can then across, come across the surface of my model and click and drag, and this is going to insert that part in my model. So this is the basic principle of using these insert mesh parts. So if you have symmetry activated by hitting X on your keyboard, you can add these. And as you add these, it's just going to start in setting these geometries into your mesh. Now as it's doing this, it's not welding or generating. It's just putting the piece of geometry in that same subtool. So it's just making it sit there. So if you select different ones, you can actually start, you know, having these interpenetrate the other ones. And this is just adding this to the surface. So think if you just had a tool and you went and you added another tool on top of it, it's going to be like just interpenetrating, going right through each other. Um, and this is the result you're going to get. Now you'll notice every time I drag out an insert mesh part, it's going to unmask the part I just drew out and mask everything else. And this comes, in to, this comes handy uh, because after you draw a part out, you can then manipulate that part. So if I decide, hey, you know, I didn't like, this is sitting too far out from the mesh, I can now simply switch to say the Gizmo 3D by coming to this Move, Scale, or Rotate, which is going to give me this Gizmo that's going to show. And this should be coming right into the middle of that part you just drew. And then now at this stage, I can use any of the gizmo, the universal transforms on this, to reposition that part. And since that part is the only thing that is unmasked, that's the only one that's going to be affected when I do that uh, gizmo 3D operation. So I can reposition a part like so. And then if I come up and say select another one, go back to draw, pick another object, draw it out. And if I want to manipulate that, go to move, scale, or rotate, which will give me the gizmo, and then I can reposition that one. And so you can use this process to go through and start adding IMM parts and then modifying them. Now, another thing with the IMM functionality is if I come and select another part and drag it out, if I have the Gizmo 3D active, this is going to give me that option to modify it. But with it active, if I come up here, it's going to look at the part that is unmasked and it's going to swap it out. 
So if I come up here and select, you're just gonna be able to select a different part as I roll through this top here. So this will allow you to draw out one part and then you can quickly come up here and just scroll through these and see if there's any other parts that may look better, may fit your design you're going for a little bit more. So you can just come through here and do that. And the process of that again is after you draw an IMM part out, if you have the gizmo activated and you come up here and click to select another part, this will now swap the unmasked part with that piece. So you can see as I come up through here, it's gonna start swapping those parts out and I'll be able to see quickly what they're gonna look like as they're applied to that mesh. So one little thing there that you may run into if you have the Gizmo 3D and you're modifying an object and then you come up and end up clicking on the bar with the Gizmo 3D active, it's going to swap that piece. So just remember that little process there. So now that I've made a mess here and just kind of covered the basics of the insert mesh brush, I now want to start generating a new mesh out of this and then go through and start um, playing with the pieces to get a little robot design. So with the masking clear to my model, if I come back up here to the move scale or rotate option, I can then unlock the Gizmo 3D and I'm just going to send it back to home here. And this will just center it back to the mesh and then I can lock that down. And now, as we mentioned, if you have the Gizmo 3D active, you have a transpose or a multi-mesh brush loaded. If you come up here and select, it's going to swap to that part there. So I'm just going to find a shape that I want to start my kind of robot here with. And so I'm going to scroll all the way down here to the end. And then we're going to find, say, one of these parts. I know they're in here. There's a lot of pieces in this brush. We'll do this pipes six. And so now I just have that selected. And then now I'm going to go out of uh, that menu up there. And now I can reposition this piece. So if I turn my polyframes here, you can see this is the geometry that that insert mesh part has. You'll notice if you zoom in that there's going to be some creasing that's going to be applied to this. So the parts in this IMM brush for the model kit has this creasing already set up and this can be used with dynamic subdivision to give your model a preview of what it would look like if it was divided or higher polygon count. So with this, I just wanna change some of the size here and make this a little elongated. So when I start making you know, these little robot characters, um, I try to work on things that I don't wanna, that after a while I may not wanna come back to and work on. And things like this usually are end up being the hands um, or the legs because after I get so far along, you know, I may lose interest and then like the hands aren't gonna be the, what I wanna to touch. So the robot may end up with no hands if I don't do them first. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna model uh, a set of hands here. And the basic shape I'm looking for is gonna be this cylindrical shape. And so this is my starting form here. I'm gonna just scale this out to make this a little bit bigger, like so. And then I'm going to go to the dynamic area over here in geometry. So tool, geometry, dynamic subdivision. And I'm gonna activate this. And you'll see now that creasing is gonna kick in. And if I turn off my polyflames and floor, you can see now I'm getting it looking a little bit smoother. If I wanted to look even more smooth, I can come to the dynamic subdivision area and there's this smooth subdivision level slider here and I can increase this. And so if I cut up to like four, now I'm gonna get a preview of this model looking really smooth. Now I haven't changed any of the geometry of this. This is just giving me a dynamic subdivision preview. So if I come over here and deactivate this, you're gonna see that this is the mesh, the true version of the mesh I have, and I'm just applying a dynamic version of it so I can just see what it looks like nice and smooth. And if you work this way with dynamic subdivision, it's gonna keep your model files pretty small, um, so it's gonna help you uh, when generating assets. So now that I have this part, I wanna add another piece to this, and this is gonna be like a circular shape with kind of a hole in it so I can end up putting some fingers, right? So I have to have some like containment area for his hand. It's going to live inside, you know, this uh, armband here. And I want to add, you know, some fingers onto that. So for this, I have a part that I'm looking for too. So I could come back up here and scroll through all this. I'm in draw mode right now. But there's another way you can open up a list of all the parts. And this is by pressing M on your keyboard. So I'm going to move my keyboard over here and then just press M. Oh, it should be pressing M. There we go. And this is gonna give me a list of all those parts as well. And so in here, instead of going to that top bar and scrolling and selecting, um, you can come in here and press M. This is gonna pop up 
this whole list of different uh, parts here, and then I can come through and select which one I want. So I'm looking for something like this, this shorter shape here, so this circular 12, and this has, you know, that little lip, and it also has like this taper that's falling back that I can put or insert into that cylinder shape I already created. So I'm gonna select that part there, and now that's gonna be the selected insert mesh part. And now with this selected, what I can do is I can now find the middle point of that other object. So you can see I turned my polyframes on and it has a point right here. And you'll notice when I hover over these with the IMM brush, I'm getting this little like pip that's popping up. And this is gonna show you where the IMM part's gonna draw from. So if I come across this one here and click and drag, it's gonna draw that one I had selected and it should draw it right out of that point. Now, as you're drawing this out, if you hold down shift, it's gonna lock it into an axis as well. So I'm gonna end up locking that into that spot there. So that process again, let me turn off my polyframes, is I'm gonna find the middle point, click and drag, and then hold shift, and then get it to the size I want and let go. Now, after this is done, you'll see I have that part now created on the other one. So I just inserted that one part into the other one. And now I can modify this by going to move scale or rotate to get that gizmo 3D. After I have this, I can then you know, make it longer or shorter. I can even taper it if I want. So you have a lot of freedom now after you've created that piece. But this one's pretty good where it is, so I'm just going to leave it there. And now I wanna start adding some more parts to this. So the whole principle of what we're doing here is we're just gonna be adding shapes onto other shapes and then making sure they kind of intersect. And then we're gonna start building this way. So instead of sculpting or instead of you know, modeling, we're just taking found parts and putting them together. Kind of like a kit bash process where we have this library of shapes and we can put them together, intersect them where we want them to go, and that's gonna give our form and our design. So the next thing I need is some fingers. And I have one shape that I really like to use for that. So I'm gonna pop up the menu here, and that's this little latches shape here. So I'm just gonna come and select that. And that's now gonna be my selected insert mesh part. Now, if you're drawing out an insert mesh part and your model vanishes, so here's one thing that may happen. So say you're working and I click and drag and now that part vanishes. So what is happening here is that you probably have Solo activated and Solo lives down here under the ghost and transparency here. So you have polyframes, transparency, ghost, and then Solo. It's really close to the bar here on my screen. And if you have this active, it's only gonna show you the subtool you currently have selected inside ZBrush. However, if you also have this active and you use any IMM part and you draw it out, it's going to isolate that part as it's drawn out. So you may not want it on if you're trying to generate something like we're doing today. So as I draw it out, I can't really see what it's doing. So you wanna make sure that you don't have solo active uh, when you have this, uh, you're doing this process of generating assets with insert mesh parts. So I'm gonna come across the model here. I have solo turned off, and now if I click and drag, you'll see I'm gonna get this shape and hold down shift to lock it into an axis. And this is gonna give me that kind of finger shape there. Now I can go to move again and move this out. I can make this a little bit bigger. So I do that, scale it up, change the kind of design there, and I can also rotate it. So I kind of want these to be coming out. So I wanna give them at least kind of three fingers through here. And then I want them to have two segments. So this is gonna be my first segment. And with this, you'll notice that this piece has this other element to it. So it has this other area right here. Now, I don't really want that area there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use another option of the Gizmo 3D, which is gonna apply a clip process. And this will come through and it's gonna take the geometry down here and mash it all the way up. And since I've used this insert mesh part and I've drawn it out, the Gizmo 3D is already in the right direction. So it's gonna center based on where that part is you drew out. So I can easily come through and manipulate this now and squish it, and it's gonna squish it right along the correct axis. So to do this process, I'm gonna hold down the control key. Oh, not the control key. Hold down the alt key. <laughs> Let me see if I, I gotta remember, hold on a sec, there we go. Hold down the control key and go to scale. And when you click control and, or hold down control and you go and use the scale option, you see it's gonna start flattening out that part there. So now I'm changing that insert mesh shape that I just generated, and now it's gonna give me this. So let's see the process one more time. So I drew this part out, well, I selected it, drew it out. The Gizmo 3D was where it was, I repositioned it, and then I'm coming and I'm holding control, finding the scale direction in which I wanna clip. And as I click and drag, you see it's gonna perform this clip action, which is smashing the geometry there, 
and then I'll be able to get that finger all the way there. And now I've just modified that shape. So now I don't have that little part that was hanging out there at the end. So now what I want to do is I want to duplicate this and get another joint from this finger. But since I already modified this shape, I don't want to go and select another part. I don't want to draw another one out. I just want to use this one I already have. So what we can do now with the Gizmo 3D is we can use a duplicate process that's built into the Gizmo 3D. And what it will do is we'll take anything that's unmasked and it'll create a duplicate version of it. Now with this, it's all going to be internal. So I have one subtool here. So as I do this process, it's not going to make it any more subtools. It's just going to keep it the same part of in the same subtool I'm already selected. But it's going to give me this other part of geometry. So to do this, you hold down control and go to move. So we're doing control and scale to get that clip function. And now if we do control and move, this is now going to perform a duplicate on any unmasked parts. So since this part here is unmasked, when I click and drag with control, you see it's now going to give me two, another one of these. So it's taking that geometry and providing a duplicate. So that process again is just make sure you have the Gizmo 3D selected, hold down control, have a part unmasked on your mesh, click and drag, and it will duplicate that unmasked area. Now, since this was a separate tool, it's going to go through and just give me that whole piece of geometry. You can use this on partial meshes too. So if you mask, say, part of a mesh and use that control drag, it'll basically do this kind of extrude functionality. But if you have it as a whole separate part, it's just going to give you a duplicate of that whole part. So now that I have this, I can now move this up and then rotate this around and reposition it. And I want this to embed into that other finger there. So I'm going to scale it down just a little bit and then reposition it in. And you can play with how this is intersecting into the model. I can just use the rotation function here and just rotate so I get it to kind of look like a finger joint. And we can scale this up or down. So there we go, so something like that. So now I've got a little robot finger there. And now what I wanna do is I wanna duplicate this finger I created. So right now I have one in the middle but I want to have three. So I want one on each side and have them kind of smaller and tapered in. So it, it kind of gives a visual uh, effect. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to clear my masking by holding down control and dragging off on the canvas. And this is going to perform a mask clear. So you can see I have part of my model masked and part of it unmasked. So if I hold control and drag off, it's going to unmask everything. And now I'm going to switch back to draw mode. And now I want to come through and I just want to select this finger part here and then not select anything else. So I'm going to take the fingers and use this to duplicate around, but I don't want the rest of it going with it. So every time I was drawing one of these parts out, you see I was getting this polygroup applied to it. And polygrouping is a way inside a ZBrush to establish kind of like a selection set. So you can go through and apply different polygroups to different meshes, and then you can quickly go through and using Control plus Shift with the Select Rectangle Brush, isolate those parts out as you work. So if I just want to see these fingers, I can hold down Control and Shift and then click the finger, and now it's going to show me just those parts. So if I just want to see this part here, hold down Control and Shift, click, it's just going to show me that part. Hold down Control and Shift, click this part, it's just going to show me that part. So what this is doing is just going to make the polygroup that you click on visible and then hide everything else. So polygrouping is a great way to do this, and so now I'm just left with this finger. So now that I have this one finger here, I want to just apply a mask to this finger and then leave everything unmasked and then flip the mask so I can just modify the finger. So I can hold down control and draw a masking rectangle around it. And now that's going to be masked. And then I can hold control and shift and bring everything back. And so you'll see that I now have these two parts unmasked and that finger masked. Now if I want to flip the mask, I can hold control and just click on the canvas. So we're doing control drag to clear. But if you do control click, this is going to flip. And now I'm going to be left with just that finger unmasked and everything else is masked. So hi, Chris, and hi, uh, Larry, and hi, Saeed. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for coming out. So this is a live stream. So if you have any questions, definitely throw them in the chat. Um, this, I will try to keep this one basic. So I don't really want to go in anything high kind of uh, processes inside ZBrush. So if it's on topic, I'll probably get to it. But if it's something more uh, crazy, then I probably won't get to it till the end, or maybe not at all. So it just depends. But it is live, so you guys can comment, chat, anything you want to know as I'm working on this. So now that I have an unmasked finger, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the Gizmo 3D. I'm going to do the duplication process again. So holding down Control, clicking and dragging, 
you'll see it's going to duplicate those unmasked parts. I can now take this, scale it down, reposition it, maybe do a little rotation, kind of get this to look a little bit better here. And now I'm just generating that other finger there. And I want to make sure that it's going in this edge here. So I'm just rotating some and moving. So it's in that form there and giving me this kind of smaller finger type process. So there we go. We got that going on. Turn off my polyframe so you guys can see this. And now I want to duplicate this again. So I have another one on the other side. So holding down control, clicking and dragging which on a move option, which will give me the duplicated version of it. And now I can rotate this one and reposition it, frame it in here as well. And this is all, you know, just gizmo 3D rotation and just inserting parts. So now I have some fingers coming out of this arm thing. So now I have my fingers. I'm going to hold control and click off like so, and that's going to unmask everything. So now I have a little robot arm doing that. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to add a little joint on the back here that a kind of piston or a metal tube can connect to to form his like forearm through here. But also this is looking a little bit long to me right now. So I want to kind of shrink it down and maybe move it in a little bit. And to do this, I'm just going to turn my poly frames so you can see these here is I just want to mask this part of the mesh here, or rather keep this part unmasked and mask everything else and then move it in a little bit with the Gizmo 3D. So to do this, I'm going to hold control, which is going to give me a mask, right? So I could come across this and do it like that and then flip it. And that would give me that process I'm looking for. But what I can also do is while holding down control with the mask pen, I can hold down alt and you'll see the little thing on the cursor here will switch from plus mask to negative mask. Now, when this is a negative mask, and I have nothing masked in my model. If I drag this out, it's going to give me a white rectangle rather than a black rectangle. And with this white rectangle dragged out, what it's telling ZBrush is, hey, I want you to unmask the part that's in this area and then mask everything else. So this is a quick little thing there that will just happen and it's going to come through. And now I have that part unmasked and everything else is masked. So a little trick there using the mask pen. So holding down control and alt, will give you almost like a selection type process. And this will allow you to mask everything but what is in the white area. So there you go, like that. So now that I have this unmasked and everything masked, I can go to the move option and you're gonna see I have my Gizmo 3D. I wanna position it back over here. So there's two ways I can do this. The first way is I can come across the model and I can just hold Alt and click. And you'll notice when you have the Gizmo 3D selected, if you hold Alt, this little option is going to be unlocked. So as I'm in here, if I press Alt, you see it's going to unlock. And then I can click on that point in the back there and it's going to snap the Gizmo 3D to that area. Now, if you rotate while you're doing the snap, it's going to allow you to position it to an axis. So you can see it's coming right there. And this will allow you to kind of snap to any points on your model. So if you want to quickly change where the Gizmo 3D is for your manipulation, just hold down Alt and click and it will snap it to that point. So I want to manipulate this part here, this unmasked area from this area. So I'm going to hold Alt and click and that's going to put it right there. And now I can use this to reposition the size of my arm and maybe scale it down a little bit like so. So I didn't want it when a slight tapered coming off the end there. So now I've gone through and made that change. So now I'm going to clear my mask there. We had a question about the wrist and the fingers polygroups looks very similar. Similar. So the polygroup process inside of ZBrush will just kind of automatically generate polygroups uh, as you use it. If you want to change a polygroup on your model, so say I want to change this so I can see a little bit clearly between the fingers and this area, I can just select that part using the control shift uh, process and get that select rectangle and click on one of these, which is going to isolate that. And now you have two options to kind of assign this quickly a new polygroup. You can go to the tool palettes and then go all the way down here to the polygroup area and just do a auto groups and I'll just assign a new polygroup to that. Or you can just press control and W on your keyboard. We'll to perform this process right here called group mask clear mask. And if you don't have any masking on your model, it's just going to give you a new polygroup. So you can just hit control W and this will allow you to assign quickly a new polygroup to that area. And then now if I bring everything back by holding control and shift with a select rectangle brush and clicking off, you'll see now I have those two areas looking a little bit different. And I'm going to change my material here too so you guys can see what I'm doing here a little better as well. 
So now I've got that arm kind of generated. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to generate a piece on the back here to connect the arm to, and then I want to take that and add a bar, and then of course give him two arms, and then start generating his torso. So one part I like to use for kind of generating a back end piece is basically like a half hemisphere or a half circle. So I'm going to press M on my keyboard again, and in here I'm going to find one of these fasteners through here. So there's a few of these. Uh, Fasteners 9 has a little bit more of a kind of a bulbous end to it, and then this one's a little bit shallower, and this one's really shallow. So any of these kind of fasteners will work. So I'm going to do Fasteners 9, select that. Since I have that nice middle point on this back of the cylinder here, I can click and drag on that, and I'll drag that part right out, and hold down Shift to lock it into an axis. And then you see I've added that piece there. Now since it's unmasked, I can go up here and activate Move, Scale, or Rotate to get the Gizmo 3D, kind of reposition it, maybe scale it down some, kind of change the shape of it a little bit. And so now I have that coming out of the back of the model there. And this is giving me that taper I was kind of looking for there. So another connecting point for my robot. And now I'm gonna clear my mask by holding Control and clicking off. So now I have the arms starting to look like an arm now. Next thing I want to do is I want to add another part that will end up giving the kind of elbow to shoulder uh, piece of the robot. So the part that would connect into his torso and then the part that would connect to his forearm here. So I'm press M on my keyboard again and now I'm going to select another part. And the part I'm going to select is all the way down to the bottom here. Let's see if I can get this to come up a little bit more so you can see it. So it's labeled suspension two or suspension three, one of these guys here, and you kind of see what they look like. And with this one, I'm just going to add this as well. So clicking and dragging, and it will draw out. This one's gonna draw out uh, like this on your mesh there. So it's kind of made to be used you know, in a horizontal fashion. But I wanna manipulate this a little bit more just to make it look like it's kind of angled in his arm and then give it you know, a little shape or form so it can connect to the body as well. So switching to that Gizmo 3D again, you're gonna see it's already putting that shape there. I'm now gonna manipulate this, rotate it around, reposition it, kind of embed it in like that, and then maybe do a little off axis kind of change here. Maybe make it a little bit longer. So something like that. So now I've got that kind of arm looking there. Let me scale it up a little bit, move it up a little bit more. I don't want to be too flimsy. And so now I have that arm like so. So now that I have my arm generated, I now need to make a second one of these. And to do this, the process is fairly easy as well. So I'm going to clear my mask, and then I'm going to activate the floor grid. And this is going to allow me to see the world space that the arm is in. So currently, right now, it's right down the middle. So the arm is going right down the center of the world. So I'm facing front on the character here, and the Robot, I want to have two arms. So I want to have one arm on one side and one arm on the other side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this arm and I'm going to go to the Gizmo 3D again. I'm going to unlock it and then reset the orientation and then lock it back up. And now I'm going to take this and just move this off into space. And I'm just using a screen space move here and just moving it off to one side. Now since I had my arm over here, like this little joints like this, I'm moving it this way. If I had done my joint the other way, I'd probably move to the other side, but at this stage it's not really um, necessary. I just need to get it off the axis there and then position it out to the side. Now after I have it positioned out to the side, what I want to do is I want to take this and I want to mirror a version of it to the other side so I have two. So I have one on one side and one on the other. To do this process, I'm going to go to the tool palette. I'm going to go to the geometry area here, go to modify topology, and in here there is a mirror and weld. Now if your camera is facing the uh, demo head here and you're looking straight in front of your character, this is already going to be set up and good to go. So on the mirror and weld button, there's these little uh, X, Y, and Z options here, and this will perform which, tell you which way that mirror and weld is going to happen. Um, since I'm in X, that's going to go this way across my model down the axis here. And so if you're looking at face on, the X mirror, if mirror and weld is in X, it's going to take one side of the model and mirror it to the other. So if I come over here and click this, it's now going to give me two arms. So now that I have two arms, I can reposition these two. So I want to make sure I have symmetry turned on, so I'm going to hit X on my keyboard. When you hit X, you'll see I'm going to get a little pip over there. And now if I perform rotation options like this, 
kind of move things around. You can see it's gonna happen to the other side. Now, one thing to keep aware of when you're doing this process with symmetry and you have multiple parts, if you come into the middle and they cross, when you try to come back out, it may end up making a mess. So just be careful if you're using uh, symmetry and kind of moving stuff with the Gizmo 3D that you don't like intersect the parts because then the next time you do that Gizmo 3D interaction, it's gonna move those parts on both sides and those parts are now no longer gonna be separated. They're gonna be together and you could get stretching geometry. So just keep them from going across the center line as you move them around like so. So just keep them out of the middle area there. So we're gonna move it, you know, somewhere around here. Should be pretty good. So HD, he's saying, this year he's gonna learn ZBrush. Now's the time, pick it up, grab the trial, follow the streams. All right, so now I need to take this and I need to generate the start of my body. And for my start of my body, I wanna generate you know, another shape and use it as an insert mesh brush. But I don't wanna add it to my arms since my arms are pretty good. And then if I decide later, hey, I wanna rotate my arms, move them somewhere else, maybe scale them up and down, I don't want them to be part of the body. I want the body to be its own separate subtool. So for this, I'm gonna to go to the subtool palette over here and I wanna append in a dummy object that I'm gonna, then gonna replace with an insert mesh part. So I'm gonna come over to the subtool palette here. I'm gonna click the append option. And then in this little quick pick menu here, I wanna find this poly mesh 3D. And I'm gonna click that really quick. So you see now this is what my robot's here. So if I wanna make star robot, I'm done, right? Already done. But now I wanna select that subtool. So I'm gonna come over here and click it. And now that is my active subtool. So now that this is my active subtool, I can now go to move, scale and rotate and I could change this if I wanted to. But I can now come up to this insert mesh bar and I can replace what I see here with one of these pieces. So remember how we talked about earlier, if you have an unmasked part of your model and you have the Gizmo 3D active, if you have an insert mesh brush loaded and you come up here and click and drag, this is now going to replace that part. So if I come up here and now click, you'll see now I'm gonna be able to pull in another shape that I can use to base my design off of. So I'm gonna grab this little latches two part here and so I've now replaced it with this piece. Let me turn off my perspective here. And so now I have a start of a middle part of my robot. So now I'm gonna reposition this with the Gizmo 3D, scale it up a little bit, rotate it some, and I'm gonna use this as kind of this area in the middle for the robot. So just looking at different parts and looking at the shapes and you know rotating around and finding the silhouettes and seeing what kind of works. So this is kind of giving me this, you know, I got his, he's got his arms out, he's got some kind of robotic, you know, torso here that's a little bit slim. I could make it wider if I want, I could skin it down. So basically just playing with the design, figuring out the shapes, figuring out the forms. So after I'm happy with that, I'm gonna get back into draw mode. You can see that this part came out with that kind of low resolution look because it is a low resolution part, but it has this nice creasing. So I can go back to the tool palette again, I can go down to the geometry area, activate dynamic subdivision over here, and then now I can increase this to kind of get it to look a little bit smoother. So just pumping this up very slightly until I get that shape looking nice and smooth. And now I've kind of got to start to the torso. So I'm gonna do the same thing I was doing with the arms, I'm gonna find another shape and just add another piece to it. So yeah, if you have a question about the tripart stuff, you can bring it up. It's I don't know if I'll get to it, but um, I can take note of it. And if it's something I can just talk you through, um, definitely will be something. I wasn't going to cover any of the tripart stuff in this session. So now that I have this piece, I want to add another shape. So I'm going to press M on my keyboard here, and I want to locate another one of those bars here. So I'm going to go with that Pipes 9 down here. Select that. I'm now going to come to my shape here and draw this out. So just to the back of this part here, so somewhere around here, click and drag, hold down shift to lock that into an angle. And now I have this beam. Now I'm gonna go back to move, scale and rotate and transform this. So what I was thinking here is something like this. So now I have this kind of, maybe the area where there's like jets or flames is gonna be kind of a hover bot, I think. And then I can get this to go like that. And once again, I'm just taking geometry and inserting it into other pieces. I can scale this up or down, kind of get it to fit a little bit better there. I wanna kind of cover up the hole that's on the back of this one here, so I don't really want that. So I'm just gonna scale this 
This is also going to give me a nice little shape here with this like kind of back tapered. So now I have this nice taper through here that's happening and also this on the back and that there. So a little more visual interesting design there. I can scale this up or down. So that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to start just adding some more parts. So I'm going to add, I want something to cap this up and I also need something to connect the arms to. So I'm going to come press M again to bring this up. And here I'm going to find, say, this cones three this is what I like. And this time I want to draw it off the flat edge of this surface. So if I draw it off here, where it's kind of where that hole is, you see it's going to come out at that angle. And what I want it to do is I want it to come out straight from, say, this flat angle here. So I'm going to hold down, draw this out, and then hold down shift. Oh, let me do that again. Draw it out, hold down shift. And it's going to add that part there. Now I can switch to the gizmo. And to switch to these two, you can press hotkeys as W, E, or R. So if you press just W, it's going to end up selecting that. And I can select that part there, move this in a little bit. Maybe scale it up or down. Reposition it like so. And that's going to now get that area there. Now while I'm building this, what I want to do is I want this to also, you know, kind of be watertight as I'm modeling it. So all these parts in this insert mesh brush are solid. So every single part that it contains is a solid mesh. So as long as I take the models and I embed them into each other like I'm doing here, if I go through and process this, I'd be able to print out this model without any trouble. So it's keeping everything, you know, nice and sealed, nice and tight, um, all the way through the mesh. So you can definitely, if you're building with clean shapes, you can come through and keep your model clean the entire time. So we got that there. Now I want to add, say, a little door option down here. So I'm going to go back to draw, select, say, this panel's four, drawing it off this surface again, holding down shift, switching to that move gizmo 3D, repositioning this like that. If I want to change the angle of this, it's very easy. Just clicking and drag to rotate. So kind of can get it, you know, any way I want it there. I can make it a little bit wider if I want. Connect it back in. So there we go. And now I can just keep adding, you know, different elements to this. So for the arms, I can go back and switch and maybe make them position a little bit better there. I don't really want this inner shape through here, so I'm going to fill that hole. So I'm going to come back up here and we're going to select another part. And you'll see me jump around as I do this between selecting pieces like this or pressing M. Um, it just depends <laughs> on where I'm at at that moment. And I try to use, when I'm building kind of creatures like this too, I try to keep the amount of parts I use to a minimum or repeat those parts. It just brings a little bit of uh, consistency across the entire mesh. So instead of having like 90 different parts on a mesh, um, just having a few, but then repeating those shapes. So that way your eye like sees something and then it also can see it again somewhere else. Um, just brings more, a little more coherence to the shapes there. So I'm gonna draw this out on that part again, hold down shift. Switch to move to rotate it and then position it into this area here. And then I'm just going to scale this down to fill that surface there. And then I want this to be a connecting spot to this part there. So I'm going to go back to this tool here in a minute and then I can have that area where it's going to fit. So there we go there. I can clear my mask and see now I have that part. So I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to select my hands or my arms really quick. Just select that subtool there. Go back to move, scale, or rotate to get me the gizmo 3D. And now I can reposition them. And so I want this to be, you know, solid through here. So I can reposition it where it goes like that. And I just want to have it embed into that surface. I can move this around. Um, you have a lot of, you know, control or freedom to do kind of what you want at this stage too. So I can unlock this and reset the rotation. So now my axis is going back here. I can also hold Alt, which is going to perform that temporary unlock, and I can move it. So if I want to position it here to kind of rotate around this area, which is that middle of that arm section, I can lock this back together. And now when I rotate, it's going to rotate like how that robot would. So now I can move his arms up or down if I want. So if I want him to be, you know, swimming or running. I could have him in like this crazy pose where he's flying forward like that or maybe just you know up like that area too. So just playing with the silhouettes and rotating around your model as you're working just to find those different shapes. So I need something up here so I don't have a lot of uh, interesting things happening to this area yet. So I'm going to hit M on my keyboard again to bring us back up. 
In here, there's some of these holds right here that work really well. Uh, they're used, basically could be used for like anything uh, mechanical. And you can put a bunch of these all over too if you want, but sometimes using these will generate interesting designs and then you can just use move, scale, or rotate to kind of reposition these and see how they're going. So I can move these around, reposition them. Now you notice if you do cross into something like this, if you go and perform that option again, this is what I was talking about earlier, you may not be able to get those pieces back uh, out because they will be like kind of together. So just be careful when you're crossing that middle plane, when you're kind of designing or trying to figure out what you want your shapes to look like. And then if you don't like that part, if you have the Gizmo 3D Active, you can come up here and just hold control and this will allow you, or not even hold control, just click. And this will allow you to select different pieces as well. So you can try different shapes. So if I wanted to have, maybe fins might look better and come play with those designs and see what that kind of looks like. So if he's a flying robot to begin with, he may need some wings. So you can take some of these, position them. And once again, just as you're doing this, kind of make sure that you uh, are keeping things embedded into other surfaces so they go nicely together. I don't know, I'm still not happy with that one yet. Let's try these, kind of interesting. And then if you don't like any of them, you can definitely undo all the way back to where you were. Control Z is the option to undo. So I'm gonna go back to my, the single one wasn't too bad, we'll probably do that one. Um, if you're working inside of ZBrush and you come through and you want to select a different part of your model, you can come over here to the subtool palette and do this process of clicking. You can also hold down Alt and click on the subtool you want to select and that will choose that subtool. So this is a quick way if you're in the canvas, you can select between your different parts. So if I come to that arms and hold Alt and just click and it'll give me the arms, Alt and click, will give me the body. So I'm gonna get that shape back, but this time I'm gonna draw it out without symmetry. To disable symmetry, you can press X. I'm gonna draw this out here. Draw this out in the right angle. Now, depending on how your uh, model is positioned here, your axis may be a little funky at the moment. So just be wary of that. You can always perform mirror and welds too. So we'll come through and fix areas. I'm going to generate this through here. Once again, I'm bumping these pieces into the other areas so they form a nice watertight area. This is also giving me this kind of interesting tapering effect for this robot too. So now I have these nice kind of curves happening. He needs a head next. So I'm going to go and find a head piece. That latches one that I initially used for kind of this shape through here. will give me a nice effect if I draw it out of the surface. Let's do it from the top. Should be able to get my center point here. Now I can move this. Now I've got this little robot head here. Sort of Johnny Five-ish. Now at any time you want to uh, make sure your model is still symmetrical, you can clear out the mask. We can perform that mirror and weld process again. This will come through and make sure everything's nice and mirrored. So you can see I had a little bit of shift when I was dragging those out. And after performing that mirror and weld, everything's now nice and symmetrical again. Keeping that to clean through there. It's gonna need some eyeballs. So we're gonna use some of these other parts through here. Like this one's pretty good. And draw that out. Reposition this. And all I'm doing here is just finding parts, drawing them out onto the model, and then just repositioning them. So there's nothing complex about this at all. It's very, very simplistic. And you can see just by doing that, I'm starting to generate, you know, a robot here. Now we'll come up to and find a, another part. He needs some kind of boosters on his back here. So there's some of these pipes and then there is, which one am I looking for? These ones right here, pipes 12. I'm gonna draw these out. You see now I have these little booster things here. So he needs, robots always need these, always.
to make sure these are inserting the mesh too. If they're not, so this area through here, you can see I don't really have a good joint area to place these. So they don't really look like they're connecting. So what I can do is I can now split this off, this unmasked part to a new subtool. And to do this, I can go to the subtool palette here. I can go to the split area and there's this button called split unmasked points. This will look at anything that's unmasked. And since we're using these IMM parts, as soon as you draw one out, it's gonna become unmasked. And so now that it's unmasked, I can split to unmasked parts. And now I'll have a new subtool that just contains that piece. And then now I can isolate that part by coming over here and just turning off these eyeball icons on my other tool. And now I can say grab a, another cylinder shape through here these round ones come across that middle one and then add this in and this is now giving me a nice connector so now I can see it looks like it's connecting a little bit better there I can now clear the mask and then reposition this and now it's not just hanging out and looking all crazy now you'll notice if I turn oh I did separate solo on I can kind of see where that is I want to make multiples of these I can now duplicate it so holding down control it's going to take anything that's unmasked and give me a copy of it so now I can add a second one of these and when I'm doing things like this too I try to usually do things in threes um, try to keep things you know a little bit more organic so kind of the Fibonacci sequence type stuff so following those kind of numbers and getting back my entire robot there. So now we've got something like this. Still may need something to connect his head to his uh, body here. And then we'll go in and change maybe some more stuff from there. So a little connector part. I uh, just basically need another tube or something to kind of connect to his parts. So coming in here and finding one quickly. So we've got pipes. Mm-hmm. We'll do this one here, the suspension two. Drawing this out. I'm gonna rotate that part. Oh, make sure it's so much turned off. You hold down shift as you're using the Gizmo 3D and that will snap to an angle. If I do it correctly. You'll see a little number variable at the bottom that's gonna pop up and show you what angle it's snapping to. Now, if you're doing a lot of uh, subdivision surface stuff too, your computer may get a little uh, sluggish as well because basically it's rendering the model as it had lots and lots of polygons. Um, so just be wary of that too. And you can always decrease your dynamic subdivision level by going to the tool, subtool geometry, smooth slider here, and just lower those down a little bit. Um, it'll make things run a little bit faster, especially if you are using kind of an old laptop like I'm using here. Uh, ZBrush is also a uh, application that does not use any graphics processor, so it's all uh, CPU based. So it does not care about your graphics processor. So if it's your first time using ZBrush or you're looking to kind of try ZBrush out, you don't need a crazy video card to use it. So what I did there was just isolated this part. Um, so I hit solo to go just so I can only see this part. Then I did a visibility check, but you can use masking too. And then invert the mask. And then now I can manipulate this. It's looking somewhat all right. I probably do find another shape, but we'll go with this one for now. And so there we have our robot. All right, let me check this uh, questions things here. So we have one question about insert mesh triparts brushes. So Saeed, so the quick answer is when you do a custom brush for say a insert mesh curve brush, uh, you want to kind of keep all the shapes the same size. If you have the first part really large and the third part really large and the middle one thing, it will go crazy, especially with large brush sizes. Um, so if you keep all those parts the same, it's going to handle the best. Um, if you look at the, so one quick thing here, if you ever want to see how a part is made in any of these IMM brushes, 
what you can do is I can come over to the tool palette and I'm just going to select a PolyMesh 3D star. So if you have this happen when you're working on your robot, don't worry, your robot is still over here. And if you want to save it, just come up here and hit quick save and it'll save it out. So tangent time quick. So here I have a PolyMesh 3D star here. So I just went to the tool palette and just selected it. And now I want to see, you know, how a uh, IMM brush was created. So I can come back into here or into my brush palette. Yeah, my keyboard's all over the place today. Into my brush palette by pressing B. And this will pop up my brushes here. And in here, let's say I want to see how the zipper brush is created. So I'm coming over here and I'm just going to grab one of the zippers. So we have metal and we have plastic. And so I'm just going to grab the plastic one. With the plastic brush selected, you can see it has these different parts. And if I want to kind of see how that brush was made, you can go to the tool palette, geometry area, and then down here you have this mesh from brush button. And this will take that part you have selected in that IMM brush and it's going to show you, give you the geometry as a new sub tool. So I have this closed zipper selected. If I click mesh from brush, this is going to be the result I'm getting. And the question was asking about triparts brush, which consists of three different poly groups. Um, so this is, I will not be covering uh, this today, but basically you can create a brush like this. And as you draw it out, it will create, this is the starting part. This is the middle part. And then it will go through and repeat this one. And this will give you a nice kind of curve thing. But here is a, uh, this is an example of kind of like the size. You don't really want to go any bigger than this, uh, Saeed. So basically the middle part, you can see how small it is. And then this is large and this is large. If you start getting too large on your start and your end, it does go a little crazy with the curves. Um, so just be um, wary of that when you're working on it. If you can keep all these three parts at roughly the same size, it's going to work a lot better when you're using those brushes. But the uh, zipper brush here is a good one to look at just in terms of the size because this one works pretty well. Uh, Randy's asking, will you show your noise trick to cut out multiple designs like your mech robot? So not today, Randy. So uh, th three streams ago, I did not go through it. <laughs> I'll have to add it to the list, um, but I, I, don't, I will not be getting it uh, covering that today in this stream. Um, the last time I think that is recorded that I demoed it was a Comic-Con demo. Um, if you can look for that one, you may have to do a YouTube search. Um, just uh, Pixelogic at Comic-Con, and that was from last year. And I went through the process of it uh, with the noise trick. And there was actually, I don't know what, when you saw the noise trick, if you saw it from the video I did probably three weeks ago, um, there's a modified version of the noise trick now using, uh, using um, Dynamesh, and it will actually give you an even better re result. Yeah, here, let me, let me tab quick and see if I can search this out for you quick. Let's see. Let's do it quick. Let's see if we can find this for you quick. Yeah, try this one. Not this one. It should be one of these live from Comic-Con ones here. Um, sorry, we're on a tangent. But this one's helpful. It's another good uh, video. So 2019, yeah, I think it's this one. Let's see if this one is. Oh, ads. Not that one. It's one of these two. <laughs> Yeah, this one's it. So this one will go through the mech process um, and the noise op option in it. So there you go. So just search for, let me see if I can share it. Let's put it in chat. There you go. See if that works. See if that works. All right. So Life Lover is asking about curved brushes. So not really hitting those either today, but he's asking about them snapping or she's asking about them snapping. Um, 
And basically it's gonna snap to, if you're in the, the curved brush will snap to the surface um, if you have anything up here in the stroke, where's it at? Picker area, uh, depth. You have one Z, continuous Z, orientation. You can change your orientation too. But this will determine also how it's gonna snap. And so the curved brush in general, it's gonna first try to find a, um, an area to snap to. And if you come to and snap on that, uh, it's gonna, it needs a point of reference. And so we'll always try to snap to an object first. If it's in 2.5D, it's gonna snap to like a subtool. So if you use a curve and draw it out on the tool you're not selected, it will snap initially, but then when you modify that curve, it's not gonna snap anymore. Um, I'm trying to think if there's an easy way I can kind of show this quick without getting too off tangent. Um, let's see here. Let's do a curve strap snap. So in addition to the IMM parts where we're just drawing them out, you also have brushes that will allow you to draw shapes out with curves. And one of these is the curve strap snap brush. And so I can come across my model. This is the one I have selected. And if I click and drag, this is going to allow me to draw this curve. And as you draw it out, you see it's gonna to snap to the surface of the mesh. Now, after you have it drawn out, you'll see the initial draw is always gonna kind of snap through. So it's gonna snap on anything that's visible in the scene. But now if you come through and click and drag this, you'll see it's no longer gonna snap into the arm um, because the arm is not the selected subtool. So if I come and undo this and draw it up here, and now I'll use this, it's gonna to snap to that surface. So just remember that your initial draw with a curve is going to look at the depth that's on your screen. So if it's the selected subtool or a other subtool, it's gonna to snap to whatever's there. So you can see it's snapped all the way across. However, if it's, when you go to modify it, it's only gonna to snap to the subtool you have selected. Um, for rotating the curve, it is, if you come across the curve and hold down Let's see what it is. Hold down Alt. No, it's one of these hotkeys. Oh, I can't remember it. Hold on. Wait for it. Wait for it. Uh, I'm going to have to make you a video. <laughs> yeah, you can rotate the... Um, rotate around this. Uh, there is a hotkey for it. I thought it was alt and I thought it was alt, but it appears it's, it's not uh, liking it right now. Um, I think I have an Ask ZBrush video on it. Oh, so Randy's asking about the IMMs. So rotating an IMM, you're going to have to um, use it with uh, Basically, the Gizmo 3D rotation is going to be your easiest way to rotate uh, rather than holding down. Uh, when you draw it out, it will rotate. So if I come back to my model kit and draw this out, if you hold down shift, it's going to basically snap into an angle. But that's you're not going to get what you're looking for. So you're going to basically need to draw it out and then uh, modify it with the move scale to rotate. Dark Knight was asking if we can use the Z modeler tool for retopologizing purposes. So the Z modeler tool will allow you to build. It's not really going to do anything for um, retopology. You can use Z spheres for retopology. You can also use there's a topology brush um, down here. This uh, where is it at? Topology brush down here, and with this you can use that to create topology. So you can just draw some curves on your mesh, cross them over, give you the meshes, and then click it, and it'll end up giving you geo. Um, but I won't be going in. That's, it's not, the, not a very beginning process, so I'm not really gonna hit on that today. And control and alt is the rotation of the curve. So there you go. All right, so I'm gonna move on now to uh, coming through and kind of taking this robot here and combining them all together, adding some paint to them and then manipulating his surface some more. So with the mesh here, so when I get through this, I'll come back if you have any other questions too, or we'll go into maybe some more stuff, but I, I need to get, <laughs> I can't stop right here. I gotta keep going. I gotta, I gotta cut down on the tangents. 
So with my mesh here, I have different parts. So I have a few of these guys here. And then I have another robot that I may jump to. I don't know. Let's see what this one looks like. Hold on. Let me do this quick. I'm going to jump ahead to a practice bot. If you guys can see what this one looked like too. So here was the, the other one I did. So a similar process, just going through and moving shapes, moving forms, looking at the silhouette and just adding different elements on top of each other. And so you can see the difference you'll get um, just by playing with the different things. And all these are just using the insert mesh brushes that are in this parts and just moving them around until you get something you like. So this guy turned out a little more beefier uh, than the uh, one I just did here now. So this guy's could be maybe like the little brother. And then this one's the, the big, the big older robot. So I think I'm going to skip ahead and just use this one because I like this one's uh, silhouette a little bit more. Uh, as you're using kind of like this building process, this little window up here is going to give you like a silhouette preview. Um, you can toggle this off too if you don't want it, but basically you can zoom in and out and kind of see this and see your mesh in silhouette form as you work. So this is handy for coming and just checking silhouettes on your model. So you're not going to get distracted by other shapes or other forms on your mesh and just see the silhouette. So it's a nice thing to have. Um, you can move this up and down to kind of make it smaller or larger. And then there's preferences for it in the uh, area here. It's called the thumbnail view. And so you can turn it off here if you want. You can also get it out of silhouette mode. You can change its uh, background color. You can change the size. You can have it generate basically a GIF version or a um, pixeled version for it. So if you want to make like a thumbnail, uh, for something you can come in here and now use this and see what it would look like in its low res form So if you're doing little sprites or something you can use this which is pretty cool you Turn off silhouette and then say let's set my background to black. You can see now I have Kind of this thumbnail version of my robot here. So if I wanted to make some sprites of him or you know, Use him for a game engine or something you can now you know live over here And I kind of see him as a sprite form so another cool way to kind of use ZBrush, you know, you're manipulating millions of polygons to generate, you know, 32 by 32 pixel um, <laughs> image. So probably a little bit wasteful, but it's pretty cool to see it looking like that. All right. So with this robot here, you know, as I've been generating him, he's been generating in this dynamic form. So if I turn on my polyframes and I'm just going to activate solar so you can see this. So this is the geometry that I have for my mesh. So it's, it's pretty low right now and I've just been previewing it in dynamic. Now what I want to do is I want to go through and if I wanted to paint on him or add some colors, I don't really have a lot of topology to do this. So if I came and grabbed say the paintbrush through here and then say turned on his coloring and now if I wanted to paint some color on him, if I come across, let me make sure I have the right one selected there. There we go. I want to paint some color on them. If I come across with a paintbrush, if I paint on, say, this area, you see it's going to be a little bit blotchy, right? And if I paint on this one, it's going to be really blotchy. And this is because I don't have hardly any topology in those areas because this is what my geometry is. This is what my geometry looks like, and then I'm just previewing it in this high resolution. So what I want to do is I want to paint this robot here is I need to convert these dynamic subdivisions to traditional subdivisions. So to get them converted so I actually do have some topology on this mesh and then I can paint on it. So to do this, I just need to go to each subtool I had in my robot I was creating and then come down into the geometry area and then click this little apply button next to the dynamic. So it's going to take the dynamic and it's going to process it and then it's going to give me subdivisions instead. So right now I'm in just this preview, but if I click apply, it's going to convert the dynamic and now it's giving me six subdivision levels and I have the model now with subdivision levels. So now I can scroll up and down and you can see the high res and the low res version. So now with this, if I came across and painted, you'll see I'm going to get a much cleaner line because I'm dealing with a lot more topology now. So this was just taking the mesh and converting its dynamic subdivisions to true geometry. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the arms as well. So select those guys here. Once again, this is still using that dynamic option. Need some water here quick. So once again, if I tried to paint on this, you know, it's not going to give me what I want because basically this is what it's painting on. So I have like no vertices 
And the painting process I'm doing here is vertex color or poly paint is what we call it in ZBrush. And so I'm applying color to the individual vertices that are on the mesh. And so since the mesh is so sparse at this stage, when I go to paint on it, I'm not going to get any details because I don't have enough polygons or vertices, um, or rather vertices to store that color information. So this is why we're using the dynamic option to turn on and then clicking apply, which is now going to apply that. And now you'll see I have some topology now on the mesh. Now these pieces too, you know, I'm getting you know, a relatively clean stroke through here, but it's still not super clean. So this area or this geometry right here is still really sparse. So if I wanted to make some designs like lines on this mesh right now with poly painting, I don't have enough geometry to do it. This is what I'm going to get. I'm going to get this kind of stair stepping effect. So what I want to do now is I want to take this model and I want to mesh it down into one solid form using DynaMesh. And then DynaMesh is going to allow me to give an even distribution of vertices across the entire model. And then when I paint, it's going to give me a clear stroke wherever I go. Now, one thing before you do the DynaMesh process is you may want to apply coloring to your large geometry objects. Because once you run DynaMesh on this model, it's going to take all these parts and it's going to fuse them all together. And then now you're going to have all these separate pieces all together, but you're going to lose this nice geometric grouping we have right now where we have just pieces intersecting other pieces. So before I do the DynaMesh process, um, I'm going to come through and I'm just going to apply groups of color to the different parts. And when I color pick stuff or um, try to figure out, you know, colors, I often use a site um, from Adobe called Color. And this site ends up crowdsourcing basically color combinations that people find pleasing. And it kind of gives you a, an instant like, oh, these colors work together. You don't have to think about it. You can just grab the colors that way and then use those um, for your liking. So I'm going to tab over to uh, Firefox here quick. And then we're just going to go to the Adobe Color area. So this is Adobe Color. And one thing I end up doing a lot is I'll go to, say, Trends or Explore. And in here, you'll get a whole bunch of different kind of palettes that... Uh, People find appealing, they posted pictures, the, now it has the option where you can come through and actually use an image and it'll grab the color information from it. But a lot of these harmonies and things you see with color are things that have been crowdsourced out and so they have like a high appealing factor. So if you're trying to make a piece of art and you want it to be enjoyable, you know, you might as well use some sort of process that, you know, is going to get a kind of a step ahead on it. So taking color palettes that people already find likely is going to, you know, give your object or your uh, art, you know, a little more appeal. Like if people already find these colors pleasing, use those colors and now your art's also going to have that appealing process. So I'm just went through and I just grabbed one of these. So I just grabbed this color and I just did a screen capture on this and just grabbed that color image. You could also save this out as a ASE file and load this into the Z color project plugin, which lives in the Z plugin tab up here. And there's this plugin called Z color. So you can load the colors in that way and then use those to process. Um, if you're just starting with ZBrush, a real easy way though is just to pull in an image um, and then apply it to a plane. So I'm just going to do that really quick in the tool palettes. I'm going to come down to the subtool area. I'm going to append in a plane 3D object. That's going to just pull that in. Now that I have this plain 3D object loaded in, I now just want to import in my texture. So I can go to the texture power palette up here and click import. Or you can use uh, any textures that are already inside a light box. And these live in a certain folder. So what I did was I took the texture that I downloaded and I just placed it in this folder. So I just placed it in the Pixelogic ZBrush 2020 uh, Z textures folder and then just put that in there. So we have my color JPEG. And once it's in Lightbox here, you can get to Lightbox by clicking this button or pressing comma on your keyboard, you're going to get a preview of it so you can see all sorts of different textures in here. And so it's kind of an easier way so you don't have to come up with the texture and import, find the file, and just copy them in this folder and then use this option in Lightbox. Just locate texture directory, pick the image, and then just double click it, and it's going to end up loading that in. So now after this is loaded in, it will now live in the texture palette up here. You can see there's my colors. Now I go to my plane object and go to the tool and go all the way down to the texture map area here. And then I can just link this to that plane. So clicking this option and clicking the image. And now I have those colors loaded in onto that plane. Now this plane is a separate piece of geometry. So what that means is that I can move this around. So I don't really want it there. I can set it off to the side, kind of position it. You can also use this 
to generate reference images too. So you don't have to have, you know, you can just have planes of geometry applied with stuff to them and you can use them to your advantage. Now to color pick any of this stuff, I just make sure I had that paintbrush selected. I'm gonna disable my texture here. You just hover over anything you see and press C on your keyboard and that will color pick. So you can see as I hover over and press C, I'm getting that color selected over here. So if I hover over this, let me move this up, we'll cover up my little robot here. I'll cover this and you'll see as I press C, it's switching to that color. So now I can quickly come through and say grab a color. I can go back to my tool I wanna to kind of colorize. I can fill the entire model with that color kind of start out. So go color up here, keyboard, color up here and do fill object. that will take my main color I've selected and fill the mesh with it. So now I've filled that with that entire color. Now I can come through and say select a secondary color. So let's do this one here, hit C to select it. Isolate that again. And now I can come through and select a different part. Now these parts right now are all still polygrouped. So they're all still these separate elements. And since I was using them as IM meshes, every time I draw it out, it's gonna give me a new polygroup. And so now I can use these polygroups to my advantage. So holding control and shift and clicking will isolate a part. And now I can just have that part selected. I can now go to color, fill object, and I'll fill it that color. I can then hold control and shift and click off to bring everything back. And you see now I've filled that part with that color. So I'm just gonna go through and just select some of these parts here and fill them with some of these colors that I had selected. So like these oranges and reds and different things like that. And we're gonna do these for these arms really quick. So I'm gonna select say, this part here, select this one, color, fill object. So I got those eyes, a little bit red there. And now I have the second part turned on, so I'm gonna turn that off right now. I wanna get all these pieces, so I'm gonna select all those. We'll make these orange too. And you can always change these too, so if you find out that, hey, that didn't really work, I really like that other color, you can always go back in and change it. Because um, you're not really doing anything other than just filling these objects with color. So we got those there, we want, say, we'll do dark red for his hands. And after you're first select, it's gonna get an isolate, and then if you click again, it's going to hide. So you can do this hide process, and I can hide those parts, and then we can flip the invisibility of our mesh here. So right now we got all those fingers hidden, but I want those fingers visible. So I can hold Control Shift again, which is gonna give me the select rectangle brush. And if I just uh, drag off like this, it'll flip my visibility. And so now I'm left with just the fingers. Now I can color fill just those and then bring everything back. And so now I have those colored in. Now I can go to my next part. So this part here, select him and turn off my hands. This one will fill with this orange. So color pick orange. Color fill object, bring my arms back to see what that looks like. I need to break this up some here, so probably get this to be this color. So pick that, color pick this, fill object, bring it back. Okay, that's looking good there. Get some yellow, and bring the yellow into here. Bring that back. And so you see this is very simple just coming in and filling areas with color. Now I have some of this red that I haven't used yet again on here. So I wanna find a part for that, probably this area here. Oh, let me make sure I pick that color. You can pick off the existing mesh too. You don't need to pick from here if you don't want to. So there we go. And then I may want his head blue too, or this greenish color. And so now we have you know, a little bit of color to our robot. <clears throat> so let's look at the questions here. So we have a question about dynameshing, so losing the hard edges. So when you dynamesh a model, it's gonna be dependent on the resolution of your mesh on how, many, uh, how those edges are gonna pertain. Uh, but yes, in general, when dynamesh floods your model, it's gonna flood the whole thing with topology and with that, it's not gonna really respect edges. So it's gonna go through and flood it. If your model is nice and you know, centered on the axes, it'll look at those and kind of hold those better, um, but it's just gonna to flood topology through it. Uh, the best way if you wanna keep every single hard form would be to do a Boolean process on it, which will weld everything together, and it's gonna keep all those hard edges together. However, when you do that process, it's gonna stay or keep the geometry you currently have. So what that means is that if I want to come through and paint some design on his chest here, this mesh doesn't have enough topology on it, 
So I would have to say Dynamesh that part and not Dynamesh something else. So the easiest process in general, definitely if you're just starting out and learning ZBrush is just to Dynamesh and just make sure you kind of keep that resolution uh, decently high so you don't lose your edges. Now for this robot, if I was gonna print them out, I don't really need these edges to be super harsh. Uh, the Dynamesh process also has the ability to add some smoothing to edges too. So if you have really sharp edges, you can kind of get this nice kind of Dynamesh blur around those and it'll soften those forms up. And that helps quite a bit if you're doing say map baking for games and things like that too. Like oftentimes you don't want your edges to be super harsh, but it just depends. But um, no, Dynamesh, you know, is good for th some things and then Boolean is good for other things and then they both work together too really well. So it just depends on what your goal is. So my goal here is to paint details on this model and the Boolean process will give me those edges but it's not gonna give me the typology I need to paint. So it's, it's kind of a trade-off. Now I could use Sculptors Pro and paint with that. Um, there's a lot of different options. <laughs> it just keeps going. A uh, question about live bullying on generating a new mesh or subtool. Make sure you're not in solo mode, Chris. Um, and also, um, if it's still doing it, we can do. If you have any times you have issues inside of ZBrush, there is this little help menu at the top here. And you can go to the uh, Pixelogic support right here, and you can submit a support ticket. And we'll try to see if anything, uh, you can send us your files and examples, we'll see if we can replicate on our side, and see if we can help you out. So if you have something that's not working or you know can't get issues to run, like uh, Chris was mentioning, you can't get the live Boolean process to work. Uh, one thing you know just that will often not generate the result is if you had solo on. So make sure you have solo turned off um, when you're doing that. If it's still giving you issues, definitely submit a ticket to support at Pixel Audio Support right here. So. Uh, we've got another question. If you click on fill object, does it affect the part of the subtools that are hidden? It does not. So as you were noticing, as I hid different parts of the mesh, so if I came through and say, just had this neck part shown, and I fill this with a color, I'll bring my little color picker here back. And I just fill this with a color. If I return everything back in my model, you'll see it did not change anything else. So it's only going to fill what's visible. So I'm going to use the color fill object right here. So unify all subtools. So you can do the uh, unification stuff. There is a script up here, uh, Z plugin tab. So inside of ZBrush, there is a certain size that a mesh has. There's an internal size and an exported size. And they go together in the geometry area. So you have a geometry size option here. And then you also have a export slider down here. And this scale slider and the geometry size slider go together and that gives you your size of your model. Now, if you go to the deformation tab, we've got a question about this, so I'm just hitting this quick. And you click unify, it's going to resize the XYZ size of your subtool to two. And this is the optimal size inside of ZBrush that ZBrush likes for for uh, sculpting, you know, Z modeler usage, everything like that. It likes a subtool, an internal subtool size of two. Now when you click that with my robot here, if I click unify on one and unify on the other, now the size of my robot is going to be different because my arms were one subtool and my body was another. So it's going to take that one subtool, unify it to two. It's going to take the second subtool, unify it to two, and now they're going to not be the same size. So if you want to unify everything in your scene, you can go to the Z plugin tab, go to scale master, and there's a ZBrush scale unify here. This will calculate the bounding box across all your subtools and then unify the bounding box down to that size of two and then go that route as well. And the scale, the internal scale of ZBrush here does come into play with Dynamesh, which is what we were talking about here in a minute, and the resolution. So a higher resolution will give you, um, you know, more of that edge holding. So we're talking about, well, your, are your edges gonna vanish and become all soft? And your resolution is gonna play a part in that. And then the resolution correlates to the size of the mesh. So those two together are gonna work to determine how much topology is flooded across your mesh. So now that I have this, I need to, you know, I want to paint. So if I come over here to the paint option and I say select a different color like red here and then go to the arm and paint, you can see it's still not giving me the clarity I want. So I've got these blocked areas blocked out with color, but now I want to add, you know, some maybe minute details to the shapes and do some other things. So I need to now take these meshes here, my two subtools, so this one and this one, 
and I want to convert them to a DynaMesh model. Now, when you're using DynaMesh, one thing to uh, be careful of is you kind of want to start small with the resolution and get it to flood and see what it looks like. And if it doesn't look like it's not holding the details, increase the resolution and then re-DynaMesh. And you kind of do this process of trying to figure out what resolution works best for your model, because it is going to be based on the size of your mesh. So for this one here, I'm going to start with, say, 256. So I'm going to cover the resolution, type 256, and now click DynaMesh. It's going to tell me that I have subdivision levels, um, and I'm going to lose them. So I'm just going to, I don't want to freeze them, so I'm going to hit no to this. And now it's going to process that. So now you can see this is the DynaMeshed version of my model. And if I turn on my polyframes here, you can see I now have consistent geometry across every surface. So what this is going to give me is when I come across some paint on this model, if I paint on the arm, I'm going to get the same clarity as if I paint over here. However, you'll notice that I lost some details because my resolution was a little too low. So if I hit Control Z, you can see this is what I had, and you can see the clarity of this area through here. But then if I redo that DynaMesh, you can see I'm starting to lose some of that details there. So DynaMesh is always going to end up doing this kind of process through your entire model because it's flooding it with geometry. It's not looking at the edges, it's just flooding it and finding them and giving what you want. So what you can do here to get around this, depending, you know, these edges don't need to be super harsh. I just see enough where I can kind of see the division too there. So I can just increase my resolution. So we did 256. I usually like to go by, you know, 256 to 512 and then to uh, kind of up that level like so. So we're going to try 512 now and then click DynaMesh. I'm going to get that little warning again about the edge loops and then process this. And you can see now that is giving me a better result. Now after you've DynaMeshed, you can see that I'm still getting some of these little jaggies in here. You can now play with this blur slider. And this blur slider will come in and it's going to give you a preview or give you a result of a blur of the DynaMesh you just processed with. So if you just ran DynaMesh, you can now adjust the blur slider and you're going to see this update in real time. So you can see now it's softening that up a little bit and this may be good enough for what you need. So you may not need to have to come through and increase that resolution again and re DynaMesh. You can just come over here and play with this blur slider and you'll see this change on the fly. Now the blur slider has this little white circle as well, and this will give you a more aggressive blur. So if you turn this off and now change the slider there, it's now going to blur out even more. And so you can see now I'm losing you know, quite a bit of my details through there um, on the mesh there. So you can change that as well and then just see what it gives you. If you want to go back to the other one, just turn that back on and then apply the blur. But if you want to, you know, say soften your DynaMesh after it's done, or you soften some of the edges, you know, if you do a live Boolean process or, you know, the edges are a little bit too harsh, you can always come back in and use that blur option on the DynaMesh and it'll soften those out. So now I've got that part done and if I now paint with that color, you're going to see and I'm going to get a nice line through there and it's going to be the same if I paint here, paint here, paint here, paint here, since I've now gone through and DynaMesh the model. So the arms are good, we're ready to go for paint. And then I'm going to go to the torso as well and do that same process. So make sure I've converted my dynamic subdivisions to traditional subdivisions by clicking apply. And then I'm going to come to the DynaMesh area here. I'm going to type in that 512 since I already know it kind of worked for the arms and click DynaMesh. Click no through that. So now this is DynaMeshed and this one did a little bit better job since it was uh, the size of the model's bounding box was a little bit smaller. So you can see it's, it was a smaller radius than the arms. So at this resolution, I got a little more geometry out of the mesh. And now I can increase the blur here to kind of soften these up a little bit. So just changing that on the fly until I get what I want. And now that's good to go there. Now at this stage, I want to disable DynaMesh. So I'm done with the DynaMesh process for the body and I'm done with the DynaMesh process for the arm. So I'm just going to turn it off and this is going to prevent me from holding control and clearing a mask or accidentally clicking and then re-DynaMeshing the model. So that one's good there now. So now one more thing I want to do quick with this mesh here is that now that I have this even topology is before I go in and start painting some details on it, is I want to maybe deform the mesh a little bit too. And this can be done very easily with taking an alpha and dragging it across the surface. And it's going to deform the area of the model. And sometimes it gives you these nice happy accidents or, you know, kind of cartoony effects to the model that look really nice. And so to do this, I'm going to go and I'm going to select the standard brush. So I'm going to hit B on my keyboard, isolate by the letter S, and then hit T, which is going to be the standard brush. And then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to change my stroke from, let's move that out of the way, change my stroke from dots to drag dot. And then now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to select an alpha. 
Now, I want an alpha with sort of this kind of ramp. So I don't want it an alpha that's got, you know, uh, straight one color like these two through here where it's really flat. I want something that has this little kind of ramp effect to it. And what I'm gonna do with this, I'm gonna use this as a deformation alpha. And so my model right now has this nice even surface topology across everything. And now I can come through and I can drag one of these alphas on the surface and it'll just taper that kind of area where I'm dragging it out. And sometimes you get these nice kind of fall offs or different angles um, to kind of give happy accidents on the meshes. So as a kind of example of this, I'm just gonna grab say alpha 37 here. And I'm gonna come across this area here and I'm just gonna click and drag. So I got alpha 37, I wanna make sure I got my arm subtool selected right there. And I'm just gonna drag across the surface. And so as I drag this out, it's gonna be deforming this. Now you may need to increase your intensity here. And as you drag it out, you see it's gonna start deforming that area. So you can start bending that out. So now I've just changed that silhouette on the fly, that model there. Now this is probably not what you wanted, but if you wanted some crazy kind of arm things through there, or maybe some crazy, you know, like he's got like weird forearms there, you can now drag it out and now you've changed your silhouette there. Now you wanna do this after you've dynameshed too, because if you do it, if I did this before I dynameshed, I'm not gonna get that effect because that surface topology wasn't even. And as you see, I couldn't even paint on it because I didn't have enough topology. So if I did this drag out with this alpha, it would give me not this result. I wouldn't get this nice, clean, kind of smooth shape stuff happening here. It would end up giving me, you know, kind of this blocky, lumpy mess. But now I've gone through and just doing that is gonna give you more style or design to your character. Now I have a few alphas that I use um, for this process. And they're very simplistic. One's a half sphere. And then I have uh, two that are basically a box that's tilted like this on its angle, and then one that's a smooth box. So I'm gonna make one of these for you guys so you can see how quick this is to make an alpha. So I'm gonna come up here to um, a tool, set, tool palette and just select the Polymesh 3D star. And then in here, I'm gonna come down to the initialize area and I'm gonna convert the star just to a cube. So I'm gonna come over here and click cube. That's gonna give you my cube there. I'm gonna turn my color back to white. And now at this stage, if you ever use the uh, initialize area, you may wanna use the, uh, def the unify here, which will bring that cube back up to two. So this is a good example for unify. And so now the cube is a size of two. Now that I have my cube here, it has you know, a pretty low topology. So you can see I've got these edges through here. I wanna rotate it so it's angles facing up. So I just wanna take it for like this and just rotate it 45 degrees, so I'm gonna go move, scale, rotate, get the gizmo, click and drag and hold shift. And then as I'm holding shift, I'm locking that 45 degree axis. And this is what I want. So I just want my cube and I want it kind of looking like this and come through and you know make this a little bit bigger so it's a square from the top. And if I turn my polyframes, you can see this is what I have here. So I've just generated a cube, rotated it 45 degrees. Now that I have this, I'm gonna go into the tool geometry area and I'm gonna go and apply dynamic subdivision to this. And when you turn this on, you're gonna get kind of this mushy type apparatus here. But I wanna activate this Q grid option and Q grid's going to provide me with little extra edge loops along the edges there. So I can turn this on to like two or three and then I can change the coverage. And as you change the coverage, you see it's gonna end up giving me this kind of tapering effect. So it's ended up giving me this kind of soft bevel edges here. And I can use this to kind of get a really harsh edge or a really soft edge. And so this is what I want to do with this here. I'm just taking this cube and I just want to soften that angle up. I'll change the smooth slider here to smooth it. And I want a ramp like this. So I want an area down the middle that's kind of straight and then I want to fall off on either side. Now after I have this, my mesh created, I now want to turn this into an alpha so I can use it on my robot. So I'm going to go to the alpha palette up here and up here, move you over here. I have a alpha from mesh option. So this is gonna take this mesh that I just made, which is the cube, rotated 45, applied some dynamic subdivision to it, and now it's gonna give me this little window that's gonna pop up, and it's gonna be, hey, here's, you can make an alpha out of this. So I'm clicking this, and this is the preview I'm getting. So you can see I've got now my cube here, and it's giving me this ramp. Now you may wanna zoom this in a little bit so you don't want the edge to go like out of the zone there. So you would kinda of want this to fill the entire process. So I'm gonna zoom in some. And now this is the alpha this shape's getting. So I have this nice soft ramp. 
So you see I have a black over black over here and then this soft ramp through there. You can set your map size. I can't get the, <laughs> the screens eating it here, but at the very bottom of this uh, thing down here, well below where my little uh, name bar is, uh, there's a map size, so you can make this as large as you want, up to, I think, 4096 uh, it will go to. And then when you're happy with that, there's an OK button. When you click that, it's now going to generate that alpha right here. So here I have that alpha created from that shape. If I want to make a harsher one, I just need to modify my initial shape again. So I'm going to change my coverage down to get it so now it has this nice kind of spike. Do that same process. Go to alpha from mesh. I'm now getting this here. And you see now I have a harsher spike in the middle there. Zoom in a little bit on this so it's framed right. Click OK. Now I have two alphas. So I have this alpha and this alpha. So one's got a little bit softer fall off and the one's got more of a taper. So now that I have my alphas, I'm going to go back to my robot and bring him in here. Move this over to the side again. And now I'm going to deform the arms with one of these alphas now. So I have the soft taper and I have the hard taper. Now, depending on where your focal shift is, this is going to take this soft taper and basically going to blend it out. So it's going to give you like a radial fall off based on the taper as well. So this is handy, especially when you're doing this um, on things like this. So it doesn't give you this nice kind of like abrupt fall off at the top of the alpha and the bottom. So now if I drag this out, you can see now this is what I'm getting from that. So now I'm getting a nice angle out of that shape there. And then if I change my focal shift here, so bring this back down to zero. This is going to bleed off more. And so now I'm not getting that harsh edge at the top and bottom. So you can use this now to come through and find or highlight edges and give different effects. Now your intensity will determine how much this process is too. So if it's happening too much, you can definitely come up here and turn this down. Um, and you can find, you know, different areas on your mesh where it's going to give you a good result. So, what I like to do with this, uh, oftentimes we'll try to find a middle area and kind of change the silhouette there a little bit. Just to kind of give you a little bit of roundness, so it's a little bit flat. So I can come in and hit it with this kind of process there, and now I have a little more interesting design to the mesh there. So I'll do this quite a bit on anything that I find kind of flat surfacey and kind of blend it out. But you can see how much this can actually change your sculpt too. It'll go really, uh, it can go really far um, depending on what you're doing with it. And so you can add this little lines there. And if I choose that other one that had a little more depth to it as well, also give me this nice little like spike. So you can see I have this nice like spike through there now. And this will just end up catching light on your meshes too. So I'll just give you a little kind of rim through there. So now I have this nice tapered flow with this arm now instead of it being so straight. And this is softening that out and giving a little more design there. And you can do this with all the parts of your robot here. So maybe one is head to look a little bit better too. There you go. And then you can do things like this, manipulate it around. And as you're drawing it out, you can also kind of play with it too. So you can rotate and it'll end up giving you uh, different effects. So now he's got a little better, like kind of like a beak now. You can like different chest processes. So it's a lot of fun playing with that one. Now the other alpha I use quite a bit is this half circle alpha. And I'm gonna open up Lightbox here. I'm gonna my alpha tab. Uh, in here I have this little thing here. And so this is basically just the same thing we did with this uh, cylinder. Or the cube. And instead I just took a, a sphere, cut off half of it, and then made this little effect. And this one's also really handy for generating little designs too. And I'll use this to bump different areas. So if I come through here and apply this, now I can add, you know, just that little element, right? And so all this was is a half hemisphere uh, kind of alpha. And you can come through and add this. I often add it in like kind of a downward motion. Like if I have something like this, I can add it just on the edge there to give this kind of effect. So it's, it's really handy coming directly next to uh, anything you've kind of inserted. And it gives that little kind of design. So for things like this, if I go to the arm again, can add this little element there that now looks like there's some you know different design elements that's coming across there you can also apply all these uh, inverted as well so if you come across and hold down alt and click it'll do an inverted process and so that will give you know different results too but it's fun to just come in and add these quick and so like any areas up here i'd probably come through and add little elements like that i want to add this just a little more design 
to your mesh. And this is all just very simplistic stuff. So I'm just using the standard brush with drag rectangle and an alpha. So now that I have this kind of done here, I can even go and say use the move brush to configure him a little bit more. But at this stage, I want to kind of just paint some details on it because we're getting close to the end here. And for painting, we go back to the paint brush. So we got the paint brush here. In here, I can color pick different areas. So if I want to add some, you know, designs or emblems, I can, you know, pick a color here and then paint it on another part of the mesh. So holding down that, pressing that C key to paint and then using this to apply color. And you can get, you know, pretty close to all the zones you want. You can come in and paint stuff out. Um, you can also end up coming through and using masking to your advantage as well. So let's say I want to protect part of my mesh. I can hold down the control key, which will give me a mask. And then I can mask out certain areas. When you're using masking, what I'll do is I'll often mask positively like this. And then I'll hold control and alt to get a negative mask. And I'll come back in to unmask. And this gives you a nice edge. So the brush itself, when you do it, if you do it positively, it's always going to give it a round fall off. And then if you come back in with a negative mask to unmask, you can end up getting a nice harsh edge. And this is how you can end up getting, you know, little designs and like edge stuff on your meshes like this. So a little trick there for masking. So masking in one direction and then coming back in and unmasking to give you a harsh edge. After you have that masked out, I can flip it by holding control and clicking off. And then now I can paint or apply a different color. Uh, so the color fill option will also respect masking. So if I do fill object now, it's only going to mask that part I had unmasked. So now I've got that happening there. I can always come back in and paint over top too. So pressing C on say this color and then coming in and painting, I can actually remove pieces too. And so this will allow you to get even more little intricate designs or elements out of it. If you want to carve in like paint holes or something like that. Uh, the next thing with the masking is that there is a lasso brush, which is really handy for making really kind of swerves or uh, swoops or curve shapes. Um, so if you hold down control and shift, we were using the select rectangle brush. Let me bring up my palette here. I keep, uh oh, my keyboard may, may have uh, finally went kaput. <laughs> I did something, I done broke the keyboard. It's going away. You're going to have to follow along just by words. Swerves. That's what we're calling them now. So control and shift come up here and in here I can select a uh, different brush. Um, and so you have different curve types here. If you hold down control on that control and shift um, with the mask pen, you'll get a mask lasso. And the mask lasso is what we want in this case. And so I can select that. And now when I hold down control and drag, it's going to give me this lasso effect. And I can now use this to mask out portions of my model. So I can come through and say mask this, maybe, you know, just add some different kind of swooping designs. And this will come through and allow you to apply masking in a quick way that's kind of not hand painted, but will give you um, kind of angles and different kind of effects. And you can hold down alt to unmask. It's this way you can get, you know, swoops and things that are masked out really quick. And then if you, and swerves. You gotta have the swerves. And so you can come through and just come across and unmask. And now you have areas masked. You can now flip them and then you could fill those in with uh, color again. And you can clean up meshes like that too. Uh, you can also mask from your poly painting as well. So there's a whole option now that lives in the masking area. You have a bunch of different ways you can mask. Uh, the mask by color, which should be here, will uh, end up opening up this little window. And in here, you can mask by any of the colors that are on your model. So you can click and drag to pick. And this will apply masking to those areas. You can change your tolerance on that. Um, there's a whole uh, bunch of stuff on, uh, if you watch the release videos for ZBrush 2020, it goes into a lot of this information on this mask by poly uh, paint area here. After you're happy with that, there's an okay button and then that'll return that masking for you. So you can definitely come through and mask by additional coloring as well. Now, after you've got your robot to where it is, so I'm gonna undo a little bit. <laughs> There's a little bit too much crazy masking here. Um, you can also apply color based on an alpha too and use that alpha to get a different design as well. So for that, I'm just gonna load in a custom alpha. 
going back to Lightbox by pressing comma. And so I have these little kind of uh, shapes here. So I'm just gonna load in one of these. It's gonna come over here. Now to load an alpha as an alpha, you just need to make sure that the file you have saved is saved in 16-bit. And then that will automatically, 16-bit gray, and that will automatically throw it in the alpha palette instead of the texture palette. So you can see that's now over here. Now if I go back to the paintbrush and I change to drag rect with that alpha, I can now come across my model and apply that. And what it's gonna do, it's gonna take this alpha and use it as a mask and then apply the coloring based on that. So I can come in and add you know, that kind of element there. So maybe it needs a little more logos somewhere else, maybe on the back here. So I can come across here and apply that there as well. And so you can add decals and things like that to your robot too. And after we're happy with our robot here, we can now render this out. So we're down to the end here. So one way you can render is you can come up to the, well, you have a preview render, which is what you see here. If you like it like this, you can come up here to the document area and just click this export. And that will just export out what you see on screen. You also have an export screen grab, which will give you your model on the canvas and then also all the UI. So you can show your friends, hey, I made this in ZBrush. These options up here for open and save are not going to export on image, so just be wary of using these. These are for 2.5D, so just stay away from these guys here. Use this export and export screen grab option to save out your images. Um, to save your model, I suggest coming to the quick save option and clicking quick save. You can also go to the file menu, which is located here, and use save as here, and that will save out a project file. If you use the quick save option and you hit comma, go to lightbox here. If you go to the project area, or actually go to the quick save area, in here you'll have your saves that were saved when you click this button here. And you can just double click these to load those back in and then your model will be back where it's left, where you left it. Uh, other options you have for rendering in the render palette here, you have a best render, which will do a kind of an AO render across your mesh. So you can quickly Click that, it'll give you a render, then you go to document, export, or export screen grab. Then you also have BPR, and BPR will be a best preview render, which will come through and render your mesh out with shadows. So you can get that as your result. And then once again, to export that back out, you can document, export, or export screen grab. Um, if you wanna export out this little thumbnail here, you can do that too. So you can position your model like this. Maybe you wanna make a little thumbnail version of him. You can go to the preferences palette, go to the thumbnail area here, and there's an export thumbnail option right here, and that will export out what you see in the thumbnail view. So multiple ways you can come through and export your model out. Um, when you export to, if you go to the document and do that export, you have a bunch of different formats you can export. One is JPEG, and that'll allow you to crop your image and also set the compression as well. So you don't have to just export out a PSD and then modify that PSD. You can definitely export out you know, bitmaps and JPEGs straight from ZBrush and crop them as well on the way out. So Shaq, I'm not quite sure what your question is asking. How would I cut out a V shape from a plane? So if you're assuming to uh, cutting, that's um, you can do use the Boolean system for that. Um, you could also use the slice option. Um, you could also just start with a uh, V shape too. Um, you could use polygrouping. There's a lot of different ways um, to cut things out of different surfaces. So we've got about 10 minutes left. So here I can try to see if we can get what you're getting into with the plane option. So here we have a plane. And if I wanna cut something out um, on this, uh, you have a few options here. So first you wanna make sure you kinda of have a decent amount of topology uh, on your mesh. So if you just selected a primitive over here, you need to convert it to a poly mesh. So you can click that here and this will now give you a poly mesh object. After this is a poly mesh object, you can now see how much topology your mesh has. So if you just wanna cut you know, out a shape, you can hold down control and shift and get the select rectangle brush. And up here you have these brushes called slice brushes. And these will come through and kind of allow you to do a slice cut along the surface of your mesh. So if you hold control and shift, you'll now have this brush selected. And if I come across, I'll get this little line. If you're holding down shift, you'll be able to snap to an angle. Oops. And then after you draw it, you can press spacebar, move it around. Um, and basically what this is gonna do, it's gonna perform a cut 
So it's going to come through and try to add topology across that line on whatever your mesh is. So if I come across the plane and do this, you'll see it's going to add topology all through that area there. So that's, this is one way to easily make sharp cuts. Now, one thing when you do this is it's going to go straight through the screen. So it's going to be 100% screen space. So whatever you're looking, if you apply that cut, it's going all the way through your mesh. Um, so it's, if you're doing it just on a plane, you know, you can quickly come in and I now cut, you know, I've cut three times and now these are all different polygroups so I can isolate this out. If I just want a triangle, if I want a hole, I can now have a hole. So you can definitely use these slice brushes for that. There's also a different slice brush that was the curve. You also have um, slice rectangle and slice circle. And these will allow you to come through and slice in different patterns too. So there we have a circle from that. And then if we do say slice rectangle, we can actually slice, oh, we get the slice rectangle, not the select rectangle. And you come through and make slices that way too. So that's using these slice brushes to come through and then you can isolate these different parts after you make the transitions from it. But once again, remember that it's always gonna cut through your entire mesh. So if I go back to my robot here, we'll isolate his arm. You can see he's pretty much solid. Let me turn off the line here. Solid polygrouping all the way through. And so if I come through and say use the slice curve on this, it's gonna cut through here, but you can see it's cutting through everything. So it cut through the entire model. And if you have um, perspective on, remember this too, because it's not gonna do it orthographic, it's gonna do the slice prospectively. So if you come across and cut, this is no longer gonna match because that perspective angle. So if you turn it off, you may get that cut being a little bit different on one side or the other. So just make sure that you have perspective off and remember that the slice is gonna go through all the way. Now, if you just wanna slice part of your mesh too, you can do that too by just hiding part of your mesh. So if you go back to the select rectangle brush and say I only want to slice part of my model, I should do it on this one. You can hide part of it. So holding control and shift will give you, the select rectangle brush will give you this kind of green box and this will allow you to select parts of your mesh. So I can select part of this and then apply the slice curve now through that. And then if I bring it back, it's only gonna happen on that one side. So you can also do that. We're just keeping, changing the visibility in your model and then applying the slice across the surface. So two ways there is to apply kind of sharp cuts. Um, the Boolean process I will be covering, I think maybe on Wednesday of next week. And that's another way to use uh, subtractive modeling inside a ZBrush. And that will also give you nice clean cuts. And it's a lot less destructive than using the slice brush. Um, so that's probably the way I'd recommend doing a lot of the cutting stuff. Um, and we'll go, I'll be going over that. I think it's either, I don't think it's Friday. I think it's Tuesday of next week. Um, this coming Friday, I'll be covering the Z Modeler brush. We'll be making a tire. So the first set of this Z Classroom Live stuff, we just did sculpting a bust. And then we did using the Z Zoo to sculpt. This one was just inserting parts. So all I did here was just insert parts. So I didn't do any modeling, didn't do anything else. I just inserted parts to make a mesh. Uh, next one, we'll be doing the topology modeling using the Z modeler brush. We'll be making a tire. So I'll go through all the processes with that um, to go and using that. So one question we have is where you use Sculptress as sort of a Z modeler with low polygon model. You can. Uh, you can definitely add topology to a low polygon mesh by just using turning on Sculptress and then smoothing. So as an example with my plain object here, if this is a little bit too low, I can activate, say, the standard brush, turn on uh, Sculptress, and then if I just simply smooth, oh, let me make sure this is a, oh, hold on there, like a polymesh 3D there, turn my lines on, and now I can just smooth, and this will divide the topology too, so you could definitely, for my robot, if I wanted to keep those harsh edges, what I could do is I could have, uh, just turned on the Sculptress Pro Mode and then sculpted the areas where I wanted to say add those uh, texturing details and then come through and add that there and then add topology and this can be based on your draw size so I could get enough resolution in these areas and then if I came through and used that paintbrush you could also use the paintbrush with Sculptress Pro 2 um, I could come in now and then if I paint with this, you'll see that over here, I don't have enough topology, so it's giving me a mess, but if I constrain my painting to this area, it's gonna be nice and clean. So Saeed, the, uh, 
is asking about the double action brush. You're gonna have to go to Pablo on that one. <laughs> Just hit up Pablo. Um, he's the one that's got a bunch of those double action brushes made. Um, I don't, th I, it, I gotta think about how to, to do it, um, but he's done it more recently, uh, I'd ask him. And Pablo is, runs the, uh, he runs ZBrush Guides, so it's an excellent sense of unofficial tutorials for ZBrush. He does, Pablo does a really nice job, um, excellent artist. So uh, definitely uh, check out his stuff. And he has a lot of these double action brushes that he set up to allow one process to happen with a brush. And then if you hold down Alt, it does another action. So hit him up. He's the one, he's the go-to on that. Uh, relax, is the relax brush for edges using ZModeler? So there isn't one in ZModeler for relax, but we do have in the deformation palette, you have a bunch of these polishes and different things and relax as well that will come through and you know polish your surface out. Um, the relax will do basically, it's just gonna try to relax, but it's gonna be probably not, like the smooth option is probably gonna give you your best bet um, in terms of kind of relaxing the surfaces. Thank you, Doug, for uh, the link to Pablo's ZBrush Guides. All right, you guys, well, thank you all for tuning in. And I actually got through an entire uh, robot today. We did, we did well. So l last week I made a, an awful gazelle. <laughs> and if you guys are doing or following along at home, definitely uh, use the hashtag uh, ZBrush at home. We'd love to see what you guys are making. Uh, once again, uh, the trial of ZBrush is out too for ZBrush 2020. So if you guys have any friends that wanna learn ZBrush or just wanna mess around with 3D sculpting in their possibly working from home mode right now, definitely check it out. You have 30 days um, to do that. We've been doing these developer streams for probably until this whole pandemic is over. So every day we're gonna try to do a stream from one of us. Uh, I believe Paul, is, Paul and Solomon are going tomorrow and then Friday I'll be back. So definitely tune into those. Uh, we also have some other great uh, ZBrush Live streamers that stream daily for us. Um, they stream anywhere from two hours to four hours. Um, excellent group of artists too. So if you have any questions or just like watching ZBrush in action, definitely check them out as well. Um, one quick question here I can answer quick. Does the model have to be in DynaMesh in order to use the Boolean? It does not. You can Boolean with, it just has to be a poly mesh. So it has to be a non-primitive object. So you can use uh, low poly meshes, high poly meshes, and you can get the Boolean preview to work. Um, the Boolean preview will go through and it will actually take your models. It's gonna hold the topology and only change the models where they intersect. So if you have DynaMesh models, it's gonna give you, you know, pretty much like undistorted stuff to, except where it connects. Um, and also the, um, the Boolean option, uh, if it has long geometry, it, it will get, keep those long topology edges. So just using it with too low res geometry is probably not what you want. Um, it works really well with dynamic subdivisions. If you want a kind of a, I'll be covering it here soon in one of my things here, but if you want kind of a heads up on that, if you go to Lightbox, go to Project, there's a computer case fan uh, project right here that will cover the, the uh, Boolean system. There's also a Z Classroom tutorial that follow along, follows along with this. Well, let me save my model here and I can load this up. And this will go through the processing. Just double click that to load it in. You're gonna get this uh, little uh, preview here. It's gonna tell you to activate live Boolean. And if you turn it on, this is kind of a demo project. It'll go through and show you uh, the tutorial will walk you through using this project, kind of how to create this fan here. And so that will come through. And these parts right now are just all low resolution models, but um, using the Z modeler brush group is what was used to create it and primitives. Um, and you can definitely use it with the Boolean system. Um, but DynaMesh works as well. You can sculpt on objects when the live Boolean preview. There's a whole bunch you can do with live Boolean. Um, and right now this is all preview. So I can manipulate you know, any of this stuff here and I can see it change in real time. Um, so it's really, really nice um, to use and it's non-destructive so you can modify your shapes and forms. But I'll be doing a whole section on modeling with the live Boolean. Thank you, Daisuke, for the blue, blue gazelle. <laughs> uh, one last one and then I gotta go. In preferences, performance. Uh, basically, these are all gonna be set pretty much to maximum for what your computer is gonna handle. You'll see that my max threads right now is turned down. So I actually have eight threads on this machine, but I reduce them to six and that's just for streaming purposes. So I'm not giving ZBrush my full computer's power because I want OBS to run well. I want you guys to be able to see what I'm streaming. So I'll turn it by performance down. But in general now, since probably about four or eight, 
Um, you really don't have to touch anything in the performance tab. Uh, once you launch ZBrush, it's gonna look at your system and it's gonna try to give you the best performance possible. Um, I would recommend uh, the multi-draw stuff, uh, I would recommend keeping this on. Sometimes people will turn this off to you know, make their computer not kick their fans on, especially if they're using um, uh, kind of MacBook type processors. But basically ZBrush is gonna try to squeeze the most power out of your computer as possible. So if you see your fans kicking in, it's trying to take everything from your machine. Um, if you have a <laughs> Commodore 6 to 4, like Doug's representing here, um, yeah, I don't know. It should find the correct settings for your Commodore 64. But in general, ZBrush will run on pretty much any system as long as it's got a good CPU. So um, it's not going to use your GPU at all. It loves high uh, speed processors uh, with uh, as many cores as it can get. Um, and then it loves RAM and it loves SSD drives. But um, the computer I'm using right now is a generation four. Uh, it's, a, it's an old machine and it's still everything I'm doing here today is done on it. Um, and so I'll use this, you know, as my go-to. Paul had a really, really old computer <laughs> forever, and he was still running ZBrush fine too. So remember, it's all CPU for ZBrush. Doesn't care about your graphics card. Um, so if you have a processor that's still running, you can download the trial and try it out and see what it does. I've had it running on Core 2 Duos. So there you go. I'll even run on one of those. Well, thank you all, and. Thanks for coming out. Uh, remember the trial is out, so if you have anybody that wants to try ZBrush, uh, definitely send them the link, get them to download it, um, try it out. We'll be doing these streams, so if you have any questions, I'm popping here and hop in. I'm running mostly uh, kind of the basic streams, so if you have any high question stuff, I can try to get them at the end, but um, Paul will be doing more of the high-end kind of questioning stuff. So, And then Daisuke, who was in the chat here too, he's doing ZBrush Core streams. So you can tune in on those and see ZBrush Core in action. And I think Solomon Blair as well will be doing uh, ZBrush Core too. So thank you guys for turning out. And if you have uh, any questions of tuning this, also check out Ask ZBrush. There's a lot of videos on that. So if you have things like, I don't know how to do this, just do a YouTube search, Ask ZBrush with your kind of question. Hopefully one of your words will hit on the tags in it, and then you'll get a video on how to use it. But that's it. So thank you guys and gals for coming out and watching the stream here and stay tuned for more of this. So stay safe. Thanks.